Okay, I think we can we can start uh, uh, this event. My name is Mari Pangestu. I'm a professor of international economics at the Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia. And here also with me uh, is Professor uh, Opsfeld, uh, who is also a fellow uh, with me. I'm also a fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, DC. So I just want to wish everybody a good morning. Uh, thank you, class, for uh, all of those you, of you joining. Uh, and also good evening, of course, to Professor Opsfeld. He has uh, sacrificed his Sunday uh, evening uh, to join us today. And today's class is actually, uh, today's lecture is actually the first class of the basic international economics course at the faculty. And we have uh, four parallel uh, classes. So I'm joined today by all the students and six other lecturers teaching this course. We and the students taking the course are, of course, immensely mm. excited that Professor Opsfeld has agreed to open our semester and set the scene with today's lecture on the challenges and trends of globalization. And given the level of interest, we decided to also open uh, this lecture to the Advanced International Economics course, as well as uh, other students and lecturers from the faculty. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, Professor Opsal's wisdom is also going to be live streamed on YouTube for others who would like to listen. And believe me, there has been a lot of interest. So uh, even though Professor Opsfeld has, needs no introduction, let me just briefly uh, introduce uh, Professor Opsfeld. Maurice or Maury Opsfeld is a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and previously a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors and chief economist uh, at uh, the International Monetary Fund. He's also the Fred Berkston Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International uh, Economics. Uh, his fields of specialization include dynamic open economy models, exchange rates, and international financial crisis, global capital markets integration, and monetary policy in open economies. He's obviously uh, published a lot of uh, books, research articles uh, in those areas of specialization. Um, and I, I noted uh, that his academic supervisor was Rudiger Donbush whose works were the materials, at least when I was an, an undergraduate, uh, as well as in, in my graduate work some decades ago, was uh, of course a reference. And it was in fact the book I used to teach international economics when I started teaching at University of Indonesia in 1986. So today we are really, really honored that we have Professor Opsfeld to give the opening lecture to our international economics class. Uh, as he is the co-author of the leading textbook on international economics with Paul Krugman and Mark Melitz, which we will be using this semester and which we have also been mm. using uh, for uh, many years uh, prior to this year. Mm. Uh, just to inform you, uh, Professor Ofsel, we have a record enrollment in international economics this year, and it must really reflect the times that we live in. Uh, mm. And hopefully for all of you students, your interest in international economics uh, in and what's going on in the world and how that should uh, reflect on your learning, your future jobs and careers is the motivation for you uh, taking this class. We know a lot's happening in the world uh, and it touches one way or another with international economics from how monetary policies in the US uh, affect the rest of the world to disruptions, challenges and opportunities of globalization in a world filled with uncertainties, greater shocks, whether it's the health shock, the natural disasters, or the conflict, and of course, the geopolitical uh, tensions. Today, uh, we, we are really fortunate uh, to have Professor Opswell share, share his views 
on the challenges and trends of globalization. And this will uh, set the scene for the study of international economics for all of you this semester. And of course, for all of you listening, I hope you will also uh, learn many things from uh, today's uh, class. Uh, it will also uh, uh, hopefully be uh, not just useful for students and lecturers, but uh, as we have made this also live on YouTube uh, for many others who are who also want to understand globalization. So uh, with that introduction, uh, let me pass mm -hmm. the the virtual floor and uh, the slides to Professor Opsfeld. The floor is yours, Mori. Hey, thank you very much, Mari. It is a great uh, pleasure to be here um, lecturing to the opening uh, class uh, in this course in international economics. As you said, um, we live in a very challenging time. And uh, you, the students, will be um, embarking on learning a lot about economic theory, about the theory of international trade, the theory of international capital movements and exchange rates. But um, as you'll see, international economics, uh, perhaps even more than many other fields, is motivated by real policy questions because international transactions um, do not take place in a theoretical vacuum. They take place in a real world of sovereign countries which have to come together to uh, form an international trading system and an international monetary system. And it's on those systemic issues of the uh, uh, topic that I want to focus today. And hopefully that will provide um, some motivation and perspective as you uh, embark on a study of the theories of trade and international finance. Um, What is the general theme of this lecture? Well, the general theme is uh, to look at the post-war history of the global economy and uh, trace some of its evolution and assess where we are now, because uh, it's fair to say that where we are now is a rather troubled point compared with um, some previous decades. Uh, I want to show the kind of progress that was made in the first 25 years after World War II. And I'll argue that um, that progress was supported by an extensive network of international multilateral cooperation that was set up after the war. Uh, this uh, general constellation of institutions uh, we call the Bretton Woods system after uh, the place at which key components were negotiated in 1944, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Uh, but the system, which was based on fixed exchange rates, broke down 50 years ago. Nonetheless, multilateral cooperation among countries continued, and if anything, uh, cooperation and economic globalization accelerated. Um, globalization grew to the point of actually unleashing political and geopolitical forces that now threaten to move us in the opposite direction that I would argue are already moving us in the opposite direction of less globalization. And so I'll conclude by asking how the international community can safeguard the core gains from globalization while meeting common challenges. And uh, as I'll point out, uh, there are many, many common challenges that all countries face, uh, some old and some rather new. Uh, to set the stage, um, I'll use a term that has been popularized or, or revived recently uh, by a number of commentators on the world economy. The, the term is polycrisis. Uh, the world faces multiple crises. Uh, this phrase was uh, invented by a French philosopher in 1999, Edgar Morin, uh, was revived in connection with the Eurozone uh, crises in 2016 by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. And Adam Tews, the distinguished historian at Columbia University, has brought it to the fore once again. And it refers to the, the 
fact that there are um, a panoply of not mutually independent crises ongoing in the world economy. Uh, one could add to the list below, but uh, it's fairly obvious that we have a climate crisis, a public health crisis as seen in the COVID pandemic, a crisis of nuclear proliferation, which is returned as an issue, uh, a problem of financial stability, instability, problems of cyber risks, food security, refugees, terrorism sponsored by states and non-states, and the age-old problem of stable, sustainable, equitable growth based on an orderly trade system. And what all of these crises have in common is that uh, they require multilateral cooperation to reach an efficient, fully satisfactory solution. Uh, some of these challenges were unknown uh, in 1945 when the post-war system was founded. Um, uh, others have reemerged, and one that has reemerged quite worryingly is the danger of nuclear proliferation uh, with Russia withdrawing from key arms treaties with more countries, uh, uh, including in the Asian region, um, gaining nuclear capabilities. Well, as I said, these problems uh, in an interconnected world all require joint multilateral action. But what are the prospects for that today? Um, foreign policy magazines covered in the fall 2023 issue declared that multilateralism is at a dead end. Um, the end of World War II was a unique moment when multilateral institutional innovations were possible. Uh, this may have owed to the effectively hegemonic position of the United States. But for whatever reason, this left us with multilateral institutions, uh, mainly through the, uh, the UN system, that have endured until this day. Uh, what I'll argue is that um, we can leverage that success today, and we must leverage that success today, so that uh, global cooperation on key problems can continue. Let me go back and start with the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, of July 1944. Uh, this picture shows John Maynard Keynes, one of the key authors of that agreement, then at the UK Treasury. And uh, uh, he is sitting uh, next to representatives of the USSR and Yugoslavia, who were actually at the conference, although the USSR as the Cold War emerged, declined to uh, join the uh, key institution of Bretton Woods, the International Monetary Fund. But 44 countries in 1944 uh, agreed to a international monetary system that would order world trade according to a certain set of rules and according to fixed exchange rates. Um, the key institutions created were the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and uh, a little bit later, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was originally intended to be an international trade organization, uh, but uh, was doomed to carry on in the form of a, uh, uh, a secretariat uh, until the WTO was created in 1995. Uh, nonetheless, the GATT system did create some rules of global trade, and presided over a number of successful uh, multilateral rounds of tariff reduction that promoted global trade. Uh, why was it thought necessary to set up these institutions? Uh, what was the uh, problem that these 44 nations, led by the U.S. and the United Kingdom, were trying to solve? Well, these countries realized during World War II that the interwar period, the period 1929 to 1939, had been extremely disruptive. Uh, it had been characterized by global depression. It had been characterized by um, uh, uh, 
political upheavals, uh, by social upheavals, which in some countries, notably Germany, Italy, Japan, gave rise to fascism and um, a, a drive to conquer neighboring countries and subordinate them. So what were the what were the what were the problems? Um, the Great Depression was exacerbated and perhaps caused by excessive monetary contraction or fiscal austerity under the gold standard. Now you'll learn later in the course what the gold standard was. It prevailed from uh, the late 19th century to World War I and again was restored in the 1920s. But it was a system under which um, countries' monetary policies were subordinated to the need to preserve a constant price of the currency in terms of gold. This required countries to hold gold. And in the turbulent conditions of the 1930s, uh, it became harder for countries to maintain their pegs to gold to prevent international investors from withdrawing funds and draining gold stocks without uh, either monetary contractions or uh, fiscal budget cutting. All of this combined to worsen the Great Depression. Countries also engaged in tariff wars. Countries engaged in currency wars. Uh, some countries built regional trading blocks and in so doing discriminated against potential trade partners that were not in the block. Uh, and all of this reflected a kind of zero sum thinking. Uh, the thinking that um, uh, I can make myself better or I should make myself better at everyone else's expense. Now, that kind of thinking has a very old tradition in um, thinking about the global economy. And you'll learn about this too later on. If you go back to writers of the 17th century, uh, the 18th century, um, a leading school of thought then was the school of mercantilism, the idea that countries are rich when they're accumulating gold by running trade surpluses. Uh, an implication of that is that if you have a surplus, you're winning. If you have a deficit, you're losing. So it's very zero sum. And Bretton Woods incorporated this insight that if countries cooperate, if they observe certain rules of the road, uh, they might actually all be better off. In other words, uh, the prosperity of one country doesn't require that other countries be impoverished. In fact, all countries can do better if they work cooperatively. And this was the idea of Bretton Woods. What were the rules? Well, it was thought that fixed exchange rates would be necessary for stable world trade, uh, but exchange rates were adjustable subject to rules infrequently. Um, this was a system with n countries, but if there are n countries, there are only n minus one exchange rates. So the US became the center country that did not have to intervene in foreign exchange markets to uh, keep its exchange rate to the dollar fixed. The exchange rate of the dollar to the dollar is always one. But the US did have a commitment to redeem uh, foreign reserves, foreign dollar reserves held by official agencies abroad in terms of gold. Uh, the IMF tried to get rid of restrictions on uh, currency exchanges that had a trade purpose that were part of the current account. Uh, this was in the IMF's famous Article 8. Uh, the system implicitly and in some cases explicitly <laughs> excuse me allowed limits on financial transactions across borders and this is a quite important point the founders of the Bretton Woods system uh, wanted to promote trade 
but not necessarily financial transactions, which they associated with the unstable capital movements of the interwar period and with financial speculation. And importantly also, the IMF also had resources contributed by member countries that could be lent to countries experiencing temporary balance of payments deficits. And this would make it unnecessary for them to adopt the extreme austerity or extreme monetary contractions that some countries adopted during the interwar period. Okay. Um, one way to think about the Bretton Woods system, as well as other monetary systems, and this is something you'll encounter also in the course, is in terms of three, uh, uh, what economists call trilemmas. Now you have a dilemma when you have to choose between two alternatives. You have a trilemma when you have three alternatives and you can only uh, have um, uh, two of them available to you. So you always have to choose two out of three. Um, the monetary trilemma, which is due to Milton Friedman originally, uh, says that a country can't be open to international trade and capital movements, um, have a fixed exchange rate, and also use monetary policy for uh, domestic stabilization goals. The point is that if you're using monetary policy to maintain the level of the exchange rate, uh, you can't use it to stabilize the economy. Uh, the way that Bretton Woods addressed these three is by limiting capital mobility. Uh, that allowed for adjustable pegs and some essential policy autonomy. Uh, another trilemma applies to the financial stability sphere. It's just due to uh, a Dutch economist named Dirk Schoenmaker. And um, he pointed out that if you have free movement of funds across borders and uh, you try to implement a financial stability policy that is different from what is done abroad, you can't have financial stability. Basically, if you're trying to regulate your banks, but you allow foreign banks to come in, which are unregulated, unreg you won't have financial stability. So Bretton Woods basically cut off funding across borders. Um, it allowed extensive financial control and it allowed policy autonomy. A final trilemma <laughs> is quite relevant to our current predicament <clears throat> is due to Danny Broderick. Um, uh, and that says you can't have complete openness, uh, uh, broadly based democracy and policy autonomy. So uh, uh, what, what Bretton Woods did is it limited openness, uh, gave countries some essential autonomy and allowed uh, democratic outcomes to determine, to determine policies. Again, if you if you have complete openness, there's a sense in which you may have to harmonize some policies with the rest of the world. Uh, if your democratic process leads to a different outcome, then there is a conflict. Um, before going into the specific achievements of Bretton Woods, I would just point out that the world of 1945 was a world uh, in which um, the legacy empires of the interwar period still largely held sway. Uh, this map of the world shows the extent of that. Of course, at the end of the war, Indonesia was still Dutch. And over the course of the Bretton Woods period, and I would judge this to be one of its big successes, um, almost all of these countries became independent. They became members of the United Nations. They became members of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, but this played out against a background of US and Soviet rivalry, which you should keep in mind as we evaluate uh, 
the achievements of Bretton Woods. So what were these? Uh, first of all, trade. Uh, this chart shows the uh, volume of merchandise trade uh, in the world uh, since 1830. Now, as you can imagine, it's hard to put these data together, so they're not perfect. But what you see generally is that um, uh, trade uh, peaked, global trade peaked in what was called the first era of globalization, which ended in 1914. Uh, data are uh, missing for World War I. Uh, uh, trade made some recovery in the 1920s, but then collapsed during the Great Depression under the uh, force of the, the uh, um, coordination failures I mentioned before, excessive austerity, tariff wars, currency wars. If we come to uh, 1950, we see trade beginning to recover so that by the early 1970s, it has reached on this measure, the previous peak level. Uh, but then, and this is something we will want to understand, trade continues to grow and it accelerates at an enormous pace in the 1990s, in the 2000s, up until 2008. Uh, The evolution up until 1970, or early 1970s, we can view as a success of Bretton Woods. But as I mentioned, in 1973, Bretton Woods broke down. And yet in terms of trade, we see even more success, which would have puzzled the architects of Bretton Woods who thought that fixed exchange rates were absolutely essential for world trade to expand. Evidently, that was not the case. Uh, another goal of Bretton Woods was growth. And here we can see growth rates for the four decades from uh, 1950 to 1960 to 1980 to 1990. And what you see is um, very strong growth in Western Europe in these uh, golden decades between 1950 and 1970. Um, uh, fairly strong growth also in the so-called Western offshoots, which are US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Um, even in the Eastern European countries in the USSR, growth was very strong. To some extent, this reflected rebuilding. Um, and in Asia, growth was exceptionally strong in this period. Later on, however, um, there is a fall off in growth, particularly in Eastern Europe, in the USSR, in Latin America, and in Africa. For the world as a whole, though, these two decades, the decades of Bretton Woods, are very good decades for global growth. But then, you know, of course, each area has its own specific uh, economic and political issues. Finally, uh, uh, democracy, I would argue that here we have a measure of democracy from the VDAM project. Uh, there are actually four types of political system charted, liberal democracy, electoral democracy, which is light blue, electoral autocracy. These are countries like Russia where there are elections, but the uh, um, freedom of those elections is very suspect, and then closed autocracies. And what we see is that uh, there's a growth of liberal democracy, there's a general growth of electoral democracy, and the latter uh, expands in the, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, recently, and this is a symptom of some of the problems we also see in the global economy, uh, there's an abrupt decline in electoral democracies and also a decline in liberal democracy. So uh, the post-war years and the uh, early 80s were good years, 1980s were good years for democracy worldwide. Lately, there have been reverses. And we want to uh, think about 
uh, those when we think about the causes of deglobalization. Okay, well, why did Bretton Woods collapse? I think this is an important topic, even though it's historical, because it illustrates the kinds of tensions that arise in international economic systems. Um, the very success of Bretton Woods in promoting trade led to increased opportunities for capital movements. There was increased speculation uh, in the system. Um, the US, uh, which had set out to uh, spur recovery in uh, Japan, in Western Europe, uh, found that it had succeeded perhaps too well in that um, import penetration into US markets grew. And this caused the labor movement in the US, for example, <laughs> to turn against trade. Um, the US also experienced inflation associated with domestic policies and the war in Vietnam. Uh, another tension was what is called the Triffin problem. And you'll learn more about that in your course. Um, I mentioned before that the US had an obligation to redeem uh, its um, uh, uh, liabilities to foreign central banks and governments uh, in terms of gold at a price of $35 an ounce. But US gold holdings were, were limited. So this commitment came into question. Finally, uh, President Nixon in 1971 uh, tried to address all of these problems by a program of reneging on the US gold commitment, a 10% across the board tariff on all uh, US trade partners to force them to uh, uh, revalue their currencies and against the dollar, to make the dollar cheaper effectively so the US could export more. Um, he also imposed wage price controls to deal with with inflation. Uh, and uh, this uh, was, a, was a real shock to the US allies. In effect, the US had authored the Bretton Woods system uh, and now it was acting without any consultation of allies to basically pressure them to take actions advantageous to the United States backed up with a 10% across the board tariff. Now, when you hear um, Donald Trump in the US promising that if he's reelected, he will institute a 10% across the board tariff, um, there is an echo of what Nixon did in 1971. So uh, to some degree, the, the US um, tension about domestic politics versus international responsibilities is not an all new, at all a new thing. Uh, all of this turbulence led to the abandonment of fixed exchange rates in uh, March of 1973, sorry, not 1972. Now, just uh, for um, your curiosity, this is the headline uh, the morning after Nixon's um, uh, announcement. And this this was came as a huge shock to the world because it had all been kept secret and then was sprung on a Sunday night uh, in the U.S., much like uh, the Sunday night here, roughly the same time. So um, the Bretton Woods system collapsed, and many people would have predicted, many economists would have predicted, that with this collapse, um, global trade would have collapsed. And in fact, there, there, there was a great deal of turbulence um, uh, you know, the consequences of the uh, U.S. Uh, leaving gold, of the um, collapse of fixed exchange rates were, were quite disruptive. One, one consequence was the OPEC oil shock. Uh, you know, uh, OPEC countries, which had uh, 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 come together to, to boycott the U.S., in 1973 over the Yom Kippur War were also unhappy that their oil, which was priced in dollars, was depreciating with the dollar. And so they sharply hiked the price of oil. And this is really the beginning of the uh, 
intensive coordination of OPEC countries on um, on oil prices. Uh, so the 1970s were pretty were pretty turbulent for a number of reasons, uh, and global inflation was rampant. But um, when the dust had settled a bit um, uh, into the 1980s, and more so in the 1990s, what we saw was that globalization accelerated and actually went into hyperdrive, something we now call hyperglobalization. So I'll give you two uh, charts that are indicative of that. The one on the left is uh, world goods and services trade as a fraction of world GDP. And you can see that um, uh, it rises in uh, the early 70s. Now, this is a function mostly of the sharp rise in the price of oil, which is traded. But then um, from about the mid 80s, and even more so starting around the 90s, trade absolutely explodes. Uh, you can also look at financial transactions. Uh, the right-hand side chart um, shows countries' uh, foreign uh, assets as a share of GDP. And I mentioned that the, the, the Bretton Woods system constrained international financial transactions. But over the course of the post Bretton Woods period, uh, many countries liberalized their financial markets, opened them to the world, and you see um, these external claims rise, and then again, starting in the early 1990s, explode. So this is another symptom of um, uh, hyperdrive, hyperglobalization. And the last point I want to make about these charts is if you go to about 2008, 2009, in both of them, which is the uh, year of the global financial crisis, uh, uh, hyperglobalization stops. Uh, trade and financial claims grow, but only at the rate of global GDP and not at a much higher rate, which is what we saw from the early 90s to the global financial crisis. <laughs> well, what, what was going on here? Well, despite the predictions of um, the architects of Bretton Woods that exchange rates would be uh, harmful to world trade if they were allowed to fluctuate, um, countries that had flexible exchange rates, actually were freed by the trilemma to devote their policy tools to domestic purposes. They no longer had to devote them to uh, keeping currency values stable. And this actually allowed them to liberalize more. Uh, it meant they didn't have to use trade policies to uh, affect the balance of payments or restrictive policies on financial transactions. Um, strangely, also, uh, the uh, Bretton Woods system had centered on the dollar. Many people uh, predicted the dollar would lose its singular status as a global currency if the uh, Bretton Woods system broke down. But the U.S. dollar's role as a global currency only increased. And to some degree, you can say, you know, if you have a global currency, fluctuations in exchange rates are less important. Also driving hyperglobalization, the Soviet bloc collapsed when the Cold War ended, and so did the risks of nuclear war, uh, or so it seemed at the time. Uh, China entered the world economy and many emerging and developing economies carried out extensive reforms. This heightened uh, comparative advantage um, opportunities, and you'll learn about comparative advantage probably in the first week of the class. Um, finance became ample as 
financial restrictions were eased and trade also runs on finance. Um, the technology of trade advanced with the internet and global value chains allowed a much more finely articulated global production structure, <clears throat> but also involving much more international trade. If different components of a product are um, produced in different countries, they have to be shipped between locations and this will raise the value of international trade. Um, another important characteristic of the um, hyper-globalization period is um, convergence in incomes. Now, what this chart shows is uh, the share of global GDP uh, attributable to the US, China, advanced countries outside of the US, and emerging and developing countries other than China. And a number of facts are striking here. Um, the uh, huge increase from 1980 in China's share from something in low single digits to close to 20% of world GDP at market exchange rates. The decline in advanced countries outside of the US, uh, the relative constancy of the US share, and certainly from the late 1990s, the time of the Asian crisis, the increase also in the share of emerging and developing countries outside of China. So there's been a, a shift in the global income distribution generally in favor of emerging and developing economies. Um, uh, China accounts for a lot of this, but not by any means for all of it. Um, another way economists like to think about convergence is with a graph like this. The graph uh, plots on the horizontal axis GDP per capita. It graphs on the, and this is a GDP in 1998, uh, GDP per capita in 1998. It graphs on the uh, vertical axis, the average annual uh, growth rate of per capita GDP uh, between 1998 and 2008. So the decade leading up to the global financial crisis. And you get a very, um, distinct downward sloping line. Uh, China is the outlier. It's up here, given its remarkable experience. But um, the USA is here. Um, Indonesia is over here. I'm assuming you can see my arrow. And these are these are these are sort of the larger developing uh, or the larger global econo economies. For many, many small economies, convergence has not happened. But if you look at this group of somewhat larger economies, the trend of convergence is very um, strong with idiosyncrasies for some countries. I mean, if you're uh, Syria, uh, you didn't do very well, but um, uh, Indonesia did quite well. Um, China did remarkably well. India did very well. So. Um, uh, this hyper-globalization period was, was a good one in many ways for the emerging and developing world. And multilateralism, if anything, intensified. <laughs> you might have thought that the IMF would go out of business, but it revised its rules. It found new roles in surveillance, capacity development, uh, crisis financing, uh, assisting debt restructuring, uh, there were stumbles, for example, during the Asian crisis, the record was mixed and it's taken many decades for um, uh, the relationship between countries like Indonesia and the IMF to be restored. But uh, the, the IMF learned and many more countries joined the IMF as the Soviet bloc crumbled. Um, a process of international financial coordination, the Basel process, evolved starting in the mid 1970s. This has been incredibly important for global banking policy and financial stability policy, and it expanded to include emerging markets. 
the group of 20 was created, the Financial Stability Board was created. In 1950, 1995, the WTO was created, uh, though this also marked the last successful round of multilateral trade liberalization negotiations. Now, I, I, I mentioned in showing you the graph of world trade and of world finance um, since 1970, how uh, the, the, the period of the global financial crisis, roughly 2008, uh, marked a kind of watershed when hyperglobalization came to an end. And it makes one wonder whether faster globalization may actually create uh, the seeds of its own demise. Now, the Bretton Woods system, as I pointed out, to some degree was doomed by its own successes. Uh, its success in uh, bringing about more world trade, bringing about recovery in Western Europe and Japan, also created tensions in the system, both international finance tensions and domestic political tensions in the US that doomed the system. And there are a number of mechanisms that um, could be at work. Financial excesses lead to retrenchment and regulation. Uh, increased international trade allows for faster structural changes, which may be associated with cultural changes. And finally, geopolitics can be at work. Um, and I want to focus on the geopolitical dimension because um, this is so relevant to our current malaise with globalization. Uh, so I want to ask the question, uh, can geopolitical dynamics be destabilizing, uh, particularly when it's led by a hegemonic power as the US to some extent was within the market uh, based portion of the global economy, and certainly completely after uh, the collapse of the Soviet bloc. Now, there are a number of factors at play. Economic successes by countries that are initially less prosperous may upset the balance of power. This was the case with Russia before World War I, uh, which uh, uh, developed, had inflows of capital, industrialized, and was viewed as a threat by Germany and Austria. It's the case with China today. Um, if you're a hegemonic power like the US, you may internalize a lot of the public goods that you provide to the world economy. It might be worthwhile to sacrifice some of your national goals in the interest of a stable system. But as rivals become more important, you more and more question uh, whether you should be bearing the brunt of the system. Um, increasing economic enmeshment leads to fears of vulnerability as geopolitical rivalry grows. Um, again, we see this very much in US-China relations now. And as we develop a technology uh, that is characterized by choke points, the fear that some other country will dominate those choke points can lead to aggressive trade actions. Now, if you go back to the 18th century, the French philosopher Montesquieu argued that um, trade would lead to global peace because um, it would be too uh, disruptive to interrupt this trade, too unprofitable to do so. Uh, 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 in, a, in a world with tight trading relationships. So he felt that trade would invariably lead to harmonious relations between countries. Uh, the history of trade shows that this is not the case. And um, Adam Smith actually had a much more realistic view of this. He's he, uh, writing in The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He said, well, trade should lead people to be uh, uh, more peacefully inclined because so much is at stake, but um, it doesn't seem to work out that way. And he laid the blame at the foot of governments which uh, engage in geopolitical rivalry using 
international trade as a weapon. So uh, clearly Montesquieu was wrong. And unfortunately, it is Adam Smith's view of the world that is resonating with us today. Um, there are a number of measures of recent stresses in trade that um, one could look at. The IMF has been doing a lot of work on this. Um, one is uh, data published by the Global Trade Alert <coughs> showing uh, trade-related uh, actions by governments since 2009. And you can see particularly uh, with the COVID pandemic, but, but even before that, restrictive trade uh, uh, actions um, uh, spike up. Now, the green bars are liberalizing trade actions. And you might think that these are necessarily a good thing, but um, uh, a liberalizing action can also occur at other countries' expense. For example, uh, uh, imagine the pandemic and you're a country that has tariffs on uh, protective equipment. Uh, you lower those tariffs because you want to make the protective equipment cheaper. But protective equipment is also scarce in the rest of the world. So that's going to raise the world price. So, uh, you know, as, we, as you go through the course, you learn about tariffs, the external effects of tariffs. Um, it can be very complicated to assess uh, uh, what, is, what is going on, and you really need to know the specific context. Um, another measure you can look at is the um, uh, Trade Policy Uncertainty Index developed by some researchers in the US. Basically, they look at uh, mentions of trade policy in the newspapers, uh, in US newspapers. These types of measures have been found to be quite relevant macroeconomically. And what you can see in the chart is that um, uh, with the pandemic, well, basically in 2016, with the Trump administration coming into the US, this index of uncertainty jumps up, uh, things get worse during the pandemic. And recently it is lower, but has not returned to the pre-Trump levels. Um, Okay, so where where are we today? Um, I would assess the th threats to trade and multilateralism to be threefold, to come from geopolitics, domestic backlash to globalization, and interactions between, between these. And um, there definitely are interactions. I mean, part of the animus toward China in the U.S. is... Uh, driven by perceived negative effects on the U.S. from import penetration by China. And this has geopolitical consequences. Uh, on the other hand, geopolitical sentiments can also lead to domestic demands for trade actions. And these are uh, uh, forces that, um, you know, in the U.S., Candidate Trump has certainly been uh, exploiting to the max. Uh, you know, he's I mentioned his threat of 10% across the board tariffs, but his threat for China is a 60% tariff. So um, uh, all of these disintegrative factors are at play. Um, what's been going on? Well, I, I've mentioned. President Trump's retreat from multilateralism. Uh, it's not just tariffs, but it's uh, pressure on treaty partners. It is um, uh, withdrawal or threat to withdraw from key international bodies. Uh, these haven't been fully undone by any means by President Biden. Um, more generally, political leaders have exploited uh, various aspects of globalization backlash. Um, uh, some of this is associated with COVID-19, which I would argue in many economies, certainly in the West, uh, has left a scarring effect and a legacy of distrust in government, uh, but particularly in the U.S. Um, there are growing U.S.-China tensions. Uh, if you look at relations between 
uh, uh, the U.S. and the EU <laughs> and China, different approaches to climate policy and industrial policy. And finally, there are tensions over the Ukraine war, sanctions, uh, the Mideast war. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, in, the, in, in, in general, um, these tensions between superpowers have put the global south in a position of trying to navigate in between, which is not always possible or comfortable. Uh, in this very grim landscape, are there avenues for cooperation? And I would argue that there are avenues and there are some hopeful signs. Now, you will probably not be aware, unless you are a public health major, that um, the eradication of smallpox globally in the late 1970s was the result of U.S.-U.S.S.R. cooperation, uh, and also U.S.S.R. Co uh, uh, U.S.S.R. Um, competition, in the sense that, you know, as I said, the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. were competing for influence in the global South. And this fight against small spot pox gave them the ability to show off and um, out their specific capabilities. Um, it was a huge success. It's probably the crowning success in global health policy, the eradication of smallpox, which was a huge killer. Um, I believe that the existing international institutions can be used to channel competition constructively. Uh, the rich countries need to raise their investment in these, including uh, something in which the U.S. has been particularly negligent, reinvigorating the World Trade Organization. Um, China is following two tracks. To some extent, it is investing in alternative international institutions, the BRICS, uh, the Belt and Road in Initiative, uh, but it's also heavily invested in the existing mainstream institutions. Uh, China just uh, assented to increase the IMF's quota-based resources by 50%, which is a huge change, uh, without any um, alignment, realignment of voting chairs. And uh, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, which is Chinese-sponsored, cooperates in a number of areas with the World Bank very productively. So um, the idea that, that China can't be tied more closely to the existing institutions, I think, is just, is just wrong. Um, one great example is the Pandemic Fund, which is a fund within the World Bank. This was established under Indonesia's G20 presidency in 2022. And... Um, uh, the Chinese agreed to this, along with the U.S., uh, along with Russia, in fact. And um, uh, what the pandemic fund does is it uh, uh, raises funding for health projects in emerging and developing countries. Uh, uh, countries are uh, required to have um, uh, co-sponsors, which are so-called implementing entities, which provide additional finance. And in its first 15 months, this fund, which is co-chaired by um, uh, Indonesia's former finance minister, Hati Basri, has raised um, uh, uh, $2 billion in pledges uh, and uh, uh, has been able to leverage its actual grants by a factor of six. So this is a great example of multilateral cooperation. One of the implementing entities is the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. So it's very much part of the system. And it seems unlikely that China will want to secede from this system and simply lead the subset of the Global South that is willing to secede along with it. But there's a challenge for the high-income countries to engage intensively and respectively, respectfully with the Global South on a range of issues, climate adaptation, health, food security, refugees, debt restructuring, and other public goods. Um, there may be other 
ways for cooperative initiatives to advance, uh, more limited informal coalitions. Uh, the Basel process is a process of so-called uh, soft law, but the post-war uh, constructions will have to be more generously financed in any case. Um, if you look at the advanced economies, um, there is a, a problem of the, the hollowing out center in many of those economies of polarization. And then it's an unfortunate fact that both the right and the left of the political spectrums um, reject the idea that international commitments should intrude on their visions of democracy. Um, I think for people like me who are advocates of multilateralism, we have to make the case that for solving global problems, it is appropriate and necessary. Um, there's ultimately no interest, no reason why a, a well-informed democratic electorate uh, uh, cannot live with rules which uh, are consistent with openness and make uh, all countries better off effectively dealing with the Roderick trilemma. And in fact, for smaller countries, a rule-based system can enhance sovereignty. It can prevent bullying by larger countries, which is also a, a factor we have seen in the Asian region. Uh, countries will also have to pay attention to their domestic policy frameworks. And one of the key uh, messages that will be uh, drilled into you in this course is about the gains from trade. When countries trade together freely, uh, all partners gain. And this is a key insight, and it's a key valid insight. But the, there, there's also an additional key caveat to that insight, which is while countries gain in the aggregate from trade, not everyone in the economy gains equally. And some people may, in fact, lose from trade. Um, this raises the importance of domestic policy frameworks, which need attention, which have to ensure that the aggregate gains from trade are broadly and fairly shared, because otherwise globalization backlash will prevail and make free trade impossible. Um, I listed a number of key elements of our poly crisis at the outset. And um, uh, I would argue that the stakes are very high in uh, the world coming together uh, as a global community to cooperate on addressing these crises. Um, one chart I like to use to illustrate this is one that was um, uh, based on a measure that was um, created by a publication that first appeared in 1945 called The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I don't know if the, if the movie Oppenheimer has come to Indonesia yet, but you should, you should go see it for, this, uh, for background on this chart. Um, with the creation of the atomic bomb and its use in Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, um, many atomic scientists felt worried about the future of humanity, and rightly so. Um, so they, they decided to publish a bulletin, which is still published. And in 1947, when the USSR uh, developed its first atomic bomb, they introduced what they called the doomsday clock. And the doomsday clock measures the number of minutes to midnight, midnight being global destruction. And the first doomsday clock in the very dark days of uh, 1947 stood at seven minutes to midnight. As the Cold War deepened, uh, you can see that the um, time to midnight shortened. And um, it fluctuated. It fluctuated with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, uh, 
uh, things got better. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, things got a lot better. But then uh, you have India and Pakistan testing weapons, uh, climate change added to the num to the set of risks. And in 2023, and this um, uh, was actually updated to 2024 last week, um, giving the same uh, verdict, uh, the world stood at 90 seconds to midnight, according to this measure. It's a subjective measure, but it's still telling that um, uh, in the assessment of this group, uh, we as a planet are closer to uh, 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 apocalypse than ever before, even at the worst moments of the Cold War. So uh, the stakes are high, time is short, and um, uh, uh, multilateralism uh, uh, is absolutely necessary, not only to solve the purely economic problems, but to uh, 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 create the preconditions for our very survival. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maury. That was uh, an incredible uh, lecture that uh, in one hour you could really cover uh, the, from the historical perspective all the way to the current situation. Uh, and I think uh, reminding us uh, that uh, ultimately this is about how we shape uh, policies uh, and, and how all these uh, factors uh, lead us to uh, the policy outcomes that we observe, whether uh, internationally or uh, domestically, uh, so that the real policy questions that we face uh, uh, today is really uh, not uh, in a vacuum of things that haven't happened before. And the, the fact that trade policy instruments uh, have been used for domestic policy purposes, despite uh, you know what we will learn in this course uh, about uh, the gains from trade and how everybody would benefit if everybody specialized uh, according to their comparative advantage and that there was free trade. And uh, the, the policies that uh, don't work, as you reminded us uh, what Adam Smith said, that the, the uh, benefits of trade uh, not being uh, equally distributed is uh, the source partly the source of the problem for the backlash uh, for globalized, on globalization. And I think you reminded us again also how rivalry, you know, in the past it was USSR, now it's China and other emerging uh, markets have led to uh, developed countries who in the past had man maintained the multilateral system to be able to work that allowed uh, developing countries to really grow in in the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s, including Indonesia, um, now is also uh, being affected. And I think what where you ended was, I guess, the most important point. I hope the, all of us uh, will agree <laughs> that multilateralism is the key uh, without because we have seen where the periods of growth uh, and development that happened across the world was when the multilateral system was working where the global economic order uh, was working. And now we are, uh, I guess, uh, at a crossroads. And I think uh, we are, uh, for your information, Maury, we are going through elections and uh, a lot of the issues around trade and how we must benefit from trade. And, uh, and, and obviously the issues are not around economics only, but security as well as resilience. We don't want to be after the pandemic and the disruption of supply chains, I think there's a whole big discussion around security and not being de too dependent uh, for for uh, critical uh, supplies of many goods uh, and therefore a, a resurgence of wanting to be self-sufficient and producing domestically. So uh, we are, uh, <laughs> I hope, uh, what was the word? Uh, I hope that we are uh, a democracy, uh, uh, not not uh, auto autocratic democracy, but uh, a, a, a real democracy in functioning, but we will see uh, what will happen with policies. But it's actually a very interesting juncture uh, for students to be thinking about these policies. Let me um, now open it up for a question and answer and any discussion. I see uh, either you can raise your hand 
or I see that there are, uh, you can also put your question in the chat, but you can also raise your hand. I, I, uh, maybe Maury, you can stop sharing your screen so that I can see. Oh yeah, uh, that would be, I can do that. I can uh, see the whole screen easier oh. to see the raised hand. Uh, let me, uh, okay, I, I, I'll stop share, wait, got it, okay, there. Okay, who wants to break the ice? <laughs> well, I can I can see you now, so I can point to you if you don't raise your hand. I think Kiki, you, you want to you want to kick off? Risky, I mean yes. Kiki very uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Professor Officer Kiki Veriko, uh, one of the lecturers for the international economics. Uh, very fascinating and uh, as Bumari mentions, uh, it's a comprehensive lecture. Uh, just let me just go to the, the, the questions, given many uh, maybe questions behind me. Uh, I would like to ask about your view on the uh, possibility of the financial crisis uh, in Southeast Asia, perhaps, or in, in Indonesia particularly, given that uh, we uh, already in the last 10 years applied the, uh, the very disciplined uh, fiscal, follow the uh, master criteria about the uh, uh, annual budget deficit, 3% of the GDP, according to our uh, low. And also, uh, we have a stable economic growth of about five years in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and then uh, we also have a declining trend in the share of uh, foreign ownership in our financial market. Uh, and of course, the inclusive uh, economy uh, works in Indonesia. Uh, given this, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, uh, stagflation or uh, inflation. In, in, the, in the pandemic, we experienced uh, more on a liquidity trap, uh, inflations, but the uh, economic growth, negative, negative economic growth, but the inflation is very low. So, uh, I would like to ask your view on the possibility of a financial crisis. For instance, if the uh, global oil price uh, increase or because of the uh, Fed fund rates increase and somehow, uh, you know, create into uh, like a symptoms in 2013, uh, the so-called uh, tap of tantrum that Indonesia also experienced. Uh, I think that's the, the, my questions, uh, given the uh, end of the Britain Woods Agreements, as you mentioned earlier. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. I would judge the crisis risk for Indonesia to be very low for the reasons you said. The uh, macroeconomic management has been quite sound and quite conservative. Um, in fact, uh, I would say that emerging, the larger emerging markets in general surprised on the upside in their resilience to the uh, um, hikes in interest rates by the advanced economies since um, uh, 2022. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're now at a phase where further increases are very unlikely and where um, uh, there, there hasn't been a collapse in growth in the advanced economies because of these, uh, these changes. Uh, so I think I think the the prospects are very good for uh, avoiding financial crisis, and I you know I just don't see the Fed in a position where it's likely to uh, raise interest rates much, uh, if at all, in the in the medium term. If anything, it's probably going to cut, and U.S. growth remains very robust. So I don't see the risk. I also don't expect to see. Um, big hikes in the price of oil going forward. Uh, uh, again, you know, if anything, uh, the world economy might be a little softer and we might see a lower price. But again, I don't I don't see that as a huge risk uh, in the near term. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Okay, before I turn to Imad, I see you have your hand up, but any students any students want to raise uh, their hand? You know, if you if you raise a question, we may give you an extra mark in your in your <laughs> in your. I assessment. think I think one student uh, raised the questions, Bumari. Huh? Samuel, uh, one student raised questions. Samuel. Oh, Samuel. Okay, Samuel, please raise your question. 
Oh, sorry. Must I uh speak through voice or can I do it to uh chat? Yeah, just through voice is better. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess this is just some observation I made. So it seems that Trump kind of initiated this uh protect uh, uh protectionism policy of U.S. trade against China. Uh, he initiated the trade war right uh, during his presidency, and I at first I thought that with Biden's becoming such an ideology, having such an ideological difference between Trump, he would kind of move towards maybe trade liberal liberalization. But but I I think recently Biden has made a commitment to kind of invest uh more money in a semiconductor industry and kind of in some sense attempt to wrestle the technology away from China. I think uh he made incentive for Taiwan TSMC in order to build a factory in China as well as subsidizing Intel's factory production. So so it seems that Biden's also doing some kind of protection. Uh, in in some sense, a uh, national security industry. So, wh what are your thoughts on Biden's recent kind of uh, po policies that are aimed, in some sense, to reduce China's access to advanced sem semiconductors? Sorry, uh, if that's uh, not very yeah. clear. Well, I mean, historically, the Democratic Party was much more pro protection than the Republican Party, and. Uh, um, Trump basically converted the Republican Party to his much more protectionist view of the world. I mean, the way I think about Trump is as a, uh, he's basically a mercantilist. You know, if he sees a U.S. deficit, then the U.S. is losing. And even if he sees a, a bilateral deficit with the trade partner, the U.S. is losing to that country, which, you know, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping he'll learn in the course how ridiculous a view of the world that is, because, um, you know, countries' bilateral trade relationships uh, depend heavily on comparative advantage, right? Uh, 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 you know, you, you, could, you, could, you could think about trade balances across product categories, too, and worry, worry about that. You know, so... Uh, 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 you know, the U.S. has a trade deficit in products that it can't produce. You know, it has a trade deficit in bananas. Are we going to get upset about that? Um, you know, as far as semiconductors go, so so the first point is that, um, you know, Biden's ideological background, you know, not surprisingly makes him more um, um, comfortable with tariffs and industrial policies than um the Republican Party would have been before Trump. And so to some extent, it's not a huge surprise that he hasn't reduced the Trump tariffs on China. Uh, but also that would have been politically damaging for him in view of the very strong anti-China sentiment in the U.S. You know, as for semiconductors, um, uh, you know, there, there clearly is a race in semiconductors. Uh, the uh, um, uh, U.S. is concerned about uh, uh, being able to produce cutting-edge semiconductors and not relying on other countries, not letting China get a monopoly. But there is, I think, is a legitimate concern about the concentration of production in uh, in Taiwan, given the security uh, threats. So. I think there's there's certainly a need for global diversification of production, whether it should be in the U.S. or somewhere else is is another question. Thank you uh, for that answer. Uh, let me now. There are two questions. I will ask them mm. to ask uh, uh, sub uh, together. Uh, Sharim uh, and then Imet. Sharim. Uh. Okay, uh, can you hear my voice? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, so first, thank you, Prof. Opsfeld, for the a very interesting and insightful lecture. So I have a question. Uh, recently, uh, I have seen that regionalism seems to take more place, more than globalization, like European countries with their EU that uh, at one point I see the news about Brussels saying that they 
uh, intend to uh, be focusing on UN uh, rejecting of uh, further influence from other countries, etc. And then uh, maybe China with their BRICS and BR or and BRI cycles, like you have mentioned before, although they may still uh, contribute more on the global scale uh, and some more. Uh, so uh, while we can all agree that globalization could bring uh, lots of benefits for our countries, especially on trade or uh, international relationship in general, uh, do you think the emergence of regionalism like the EU or RCEP or maybe others more uh, could be an another alternative for uh, for countries to gain uh, benefits from globalization in this case uh, as, uh, for uh, trade policy or maybe uh, international economic policy in general. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, Imad, I mean, and then I have one more student, uh, Muhammad Dirham. Let's collect a few questions and then uh, Maury can uh, finish it, uh, answer the questions and I think we'll be then close to the end. All right, uh, Imad. Uh, can you hear Muhammad me? Dirham? Yeah, Imad, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Professor Osfeld. Um, uh, just quick questions. You mentioned about the needs for a rules-based system, right? So do you think it's really, really necessary um, for that system, for the whole world, instead of, you know, um, 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 well, let's say if the status quo is going on, well, bad maybe, but it's okay. Do you think it's really needed, this rules-based system? And what, what kind of rules-based system you're envisioning, you think? Would it be closer to Bretton Woods or, or, or something else? Um, would like to hear your opinion. Uh, thank you, Yumari. Yeah. Um, siapa tadi? Muhammad. Yeah. Muhammad Dirham. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor and Professor Mari Alfi. Um, as we know that uh, the political situation and tension is being hotter and hotter in these few days in the Middle East, and this had have one of these disruption occurred with the disruption of the Red Sea by the Houthi group, which had a great impact and disturbed the world trade. Uh, in your opinion, what steps should be taken by the world leaders and we as an economics? And what and what's the medium and long-term effect could be occur if this political tension does not uh, subsidize? Uh, remembering that C, uh, a C, C trade is one of the vital keys to the global to the global trade industries. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll. Ch I think we can take one or two more questions, and then we'll let right. Maury gonna, answer. Or are you going to forget? I, you want to I'm answer gonna, first? Okay. I'm going to forget. Right. Okay. Am okay. I, okay. Am I already? I've forgotten. Um, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. On the first question, I think I think regional trade agreements can certainly play a positive role, uh, provided they basically. Um, comport with the rules of the WTO. They're non-discriminatory. Um, uh, you know, I th one of the things I regret most is that something I worked on when I was in the White House, which is the TPP. I think that would have been uh, a great boon for the uh, for the Pacific region. Uh, uh, you know, you you do you do have um, the um, uh, successor that the U.S. does not participate in, but it's much, you know, it's much diminished compared to what it would have been. And particularly from the U.S.'s standpoint, you know, if you if you want to compete in Asia uh, uh, with China, uh, you know, the TPP was a was a was a great uh, platform for that, which the U.S. just walked away from. And it kind of indicates the you know, the really lack of any sort of um, deep thought in the Trump administration in terms of uh, policy toward China. Like, how how would you best counteract China's influence in the region? Is it by completely disengaging and you know hitting China with tariffs? I mean, that you know it's it's mind boggling actually. So uh, yeah, I think in the in the absence of broader multilateral um, uh, agreements, uh, regional agreements, certainly have some role subject to certain rules. And that, that sort of brings us to the question of the rules, the rules-based system. Um, uh, uh, you know, the basic rules that have governed international trade since the GATT, um, you know, most favored nation, uh, uh, for example, you know, have been extremely conducive to orderly international trade. 
and to fair fairer international trade and to um, uh, minimizing trade conflict. So, you know, I think at some level those those sorts of rules can be very useful. I don't think we need rules about um, uh, fixing exchange rates. Uh, you know, if countries wish to fix, they can fix under the IMF system. They're basically free to uh, choose their uh, systems. Uh, there may be a need for the kind of restrictions that the IMF embodies on currency manipulation to gain uh, uh, advantages, competitive advantage in trade. Now, you know, having said that, those rules that are written into the IMF articles have never been enforced in any way. But they at least provide some guidelines or norms of behavior, which I think are very useful. Um, yeah, with respect to the Middle East, um, uh, yeah, I think the 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 Houthi actions are very disruptive for the world economy, and they uh, could could spill into even more disruptive actions. But the answer is to, um, you know, stabilize the region uh, and to basically um, put the, the current hostilities uh, on the path to resolution, to cessation and resolution. So I don't want to get into the politics of that, but um, uh, the problem is a much broader one of, uh, of uh, bringing sustainability to the region. I don't see how you can do that without some very big political changes on the ground. And uh, my understanding is that the Biden administration is pushing for some of those right now, but um, it will probably require um, some time to, uh, to bring about and maybe some domestic political changes in some of the countries that are involved. Okay, we still have two or three, about four minutes left, so I think we can take one or two more questions. Anybody else want to raise a question? There is one question moved from Haikal Maulana. Okay, Haikal. Haikal? Uh, yeah, I'm here. So... Thank you for the lecture, but I kind of have a question regarding... Can you speak louder? Uh, closer to your mic, maybe. Oh, okay. Is this clear, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you for the lecture. And I was just going to ask, given the condition that needs, like, the urgent cooperation of, of a lot of countries, I think it will need a good multilateral cooperation, right? So, so a uh, good self of check and balance system should also be applied there. And my question then becomes like, what kind of multilateral cooperation that is ideally good for the current climate of economy and how will it keep itself in check of its progress to the objective? Thank you. Well, I think, I think the, um, you know, the, um, as I pointed out, and as you know, there, there are a number of, areas where multilateral cooperation is needed and essentially um, different problems uh, require different approaches depending on the, the, the institutions that have already been put in place to deal with them um, uh, you know if we if we want to worry about nuclear proliferation um, it's hard to really know what to do as the number of nuclear powers uh, grows. Effectively, you need these uh, nuclear countries to come together to agree to some sorts of arms limitations. And that seems like a big, a big ask, but, um, you know, without without that, I just see the problem proliferating. I see nuclear materials possibly getting into the hands of non-state actors. It's a nightmare. I mean, other problems are easier. For example, if we think about global public health, we have a World Health Organization. Uh, it's it's very underfunded. It's very underfunded. I mean, the um, the budget of the 
entire wealth, World Health Organization is about two thirds of the budget of the uh, medical campus at the University of California, San Francisco. And that I, that I find that an amazing statistic that here we have an organization which is trying to oversee global public health worldwide and the funding is 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 you know below that of um, uh, a medical university. So how do we you know how do we you know and we're talking and we're talking about not that much money. So the you know the world bank the, the current World Health Organization budget is uh, between six and seven billion dollars, which is tiny. It's tiny. So um, you know do we think that the world can't invest ten billion dollars more a year in uh, uh, global public health, which would which would you know nearly double that number. Uh, of course they can. Uh, this is much smaller than the costs of the climate crisis. And when we talk about multilateral cooperation over climate, uh, you know this is something that's been uh, managed through the. Uh, 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 UCOP process. Um, it gave us the Paris Agreement, but um, we're still falling short because the climate crisis is more advanced than we thought. So, what what do we do? Um, you know, countries need to come together, particularly the rich countries, with large investments in uh, climate adaptation and mitigation worldwide. Uh, they need uh, to do more in terms of carbon taxes. Uh, uh, Europe has one; the U.S. doesn't. Uh, but these problems are not are not easy. But until the world wakes up and starts working on them uh, uh, seriously, um, uh, conditions will just deteriorate. Uh, it's not doesn't seem likely to me that. Um, We'll create another big institution to deal with climate. Um, my friend and colleague Ken Rogoff has suggested a World Climate Bank. Um, I'm not sure we have the global, um, you know, cohesion to put together some institution like that. But uh, you know, the existing, uh, you know, the, the the existing frameworks are just not not doing enough. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we've unfortunately come uh, to the end of our allocated time uh, to have a discussion with you, Maury. Uh, but I think we've all learned a huge amount today. Uh, I hope the students appreciate how much of a treat they have in having you to open their lecture today, op open uh, the semester today. Uh, and certainly from the questions you got, uh, you can see that uh, at least we are all following some of the key challenges and issues, uh, including the multilateralism issue, as well as all the crises and the challenges that we are facing. So I think, uh, I, I hope that uh, through this semester, both for the international economics course, as well as the um, advanced uh, international economics course, actually we have all these topics uh, within the advanced international mm -hmm. economics course, including climate, and trade, uh, as well as the financial crisis and so on. So hopefully uh, this has provided them with a very good uh, scene setting. Uh, and I just wanted to say something on TPP because I couldn't agree more with you, but you know, when uh, in 2015, uh, Indonesia actually raised its hand and said they wanted to join TPP. And it was actually a, a very good for Indonesia in the sense that the, the president came back and said to all the, his ministers and said, you have to study this agreement and see where the gaps are between where we are today and where, um, where we need to be for TPP. And it was actually a very good exercise. Uh, so it was very unfortunate mm -hmm. that uh, in 2016, uh, what happened. Uh, but anyway, those, uh, those analysis and studies, uh, I think, need, could be updated uh, for some, we, we never know, some future uh, opening uh, in the future, because reforms can come not just from multilateral agreements, but also from regional agreements, as we all very much know uh, in this part of the world.
So uh, thank you so much, Maury. Um, and I really, uh, I'm sure everybody can uh, clap, give a big clap, maybe virtually. <laughs> I don't know how to do this in a Zoom, <laughs> but uh, really appreciate uh, clap back. <laughs> you taking your time. <laughs> there you go. The virtual yeah, clap. There, uh, there, is a, there is a Zoom clap. Function. Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I don't know whether, can, can we take a picture? I Sometimes we do this on a Zoom, but everybody's got to turn their video on. Let's just take, is somebody can yes. can somebody yeah. just take a picture before we before we let Maury go? Okay, students, uh, this is your opportunity to take a picture. <laughs> Mas Eko bisa dibantu? Screenshot. Okay, okay. One, yeah. two, yeah. okay. We need to take several, I think, because there are some pages. Yeah, eight pages. Eight, 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 eight pages. pages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, rare opportunity. <laughs> three. Okay. One more. <laughs> Two, three. One. Two. The new <laughs> <laughs> We're tired of smiling. <laughs> yeah, we have like or more than two hundred here One, on Zoom. Three. Wow. And one, two, three. One, two. Three. There is also the proof of attendance. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. One, okay. One more. One more. Okay. That's one, one more. Okay. Satu, dua. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you again, Mori. Uh, we will be sending you what is it? A virtual certificate, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> of appreciation. Well, I, hope, I hope you all enjoy learning about international economics. It's fun and useful and relevant. Yay. Yeah. Using your book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah using Thank your you. book. <laughs> even, even better. Okay, uh, Prof. Uh, Maury, okay. you can exit. We need to give them some administration uh, details like, you know, exams and assignments. So uh, right. thank you again. And uh, thank you. I'll see you. Thank you, Prof. So, I failed. Thank, you. Bye. thank you so much. Bye. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Oke. Okay. Uh, Ini udah banyak yang sign out nih, kayaknya mesti dikasih tahu lagi. Tolong, iya tolong, sih kelas belum selesai. Kelasnya belum selesai. Nih. Kelasnya <laughs> belum selesai. Yeah. Di kelas saya udah saya beritahu kok. Di, di kelas saya udah saya beritahu. Jadi, uh, jadi yang ngambil ekonomi internasional jangan sign off dulu ya. Ini masih yeah. ada. Yang KPAT boleh bubar. Yang lain kalau mau exit. Exit, Apa tapi yang mahasiswa uh, internasional. Akinlan uh, boleh exit bu. Ah, lanjut apa? Lanjut, Akinlan. Eh, oh, Akinlan, Akinlan juga ya, Prof. Ekinlan, boleh exit, Ekinlan, exit, exit lanjutan ya. Oke, okay, thank you. Boleh exit, uh, exit. Ada, ada. Oke, okay, how many left? <laughs> Masih Ini banyak kan? Ini hanya Akin aja, hanya Akin. We should have like 120, around 120. Okay. Oke, okay. ya selamat pagi ya uh, adik-adik uh, yang mengambil <laughs> international international economics uh, di sini kayaknya hadir semua sih dosennya uh, kita sedikit uh, menutup uh, sesi Profeni, kelas maybe, kenapa? Profeni, maybe you can speak in English because we have also international oh. class students. Oh, we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, I didn't realize it. Okay.